By way of review, or by way of telling some of you for the first time, if you haven't been with us, we are in this series that's nine parts. It's called The Ways of Grace, where we are looking at the ways that God's grace intersects with our lives so that we might view the world, ourselves, and the people around us in light of the grace that God has shown us, rather than what most of us do. What most of us do is operate out of our sin. And we allow the sin that's been committed against us or the sins that we've committed against others uh, to bring shame in our lives and and all the pain that comes with sin. We've let that really shape how we see ourselves and how we see others. And so we've been working through this series about talking about the ways we do that and how we can turn to God so that we don't do that any longer. Now, We've been using a tool, an instrument called the Enneagram to help us in this conversation. The Enneagram is spelled E-N-N-E-A-G-R-A-M. It is a personality test of sorts, but to me it's much more than that. Now, it's not the gospel, it's not the Bible, so we won't be using that to turn to as our source of a savior. We turn to the scripture for that, we turn to Christ for that. However, this tool helped me, and I think it can help you. I, I took the, the test for the first time officially over the summer. I had taken some, some others before, but I took the official test over the summer and discovered my personality type or my uh, Enneagram type, more uh, better said, I think. And what it helped me see is, gosh, this is why I see things the way I do and how God made me and how sin has impacted me. And so I began to have a little more grace for myself. And I also began to have more grace for others. So my wife, for instance, she's a type one. We talked about that in week one, a perfectionist. So I'm like, oh, this is why a lot of things. Um, (laughs) No, (laughs) no. This is why white really means white to her and it doesn't mean like this different shade or anyway. So lots of things and ways that we've had fun with it in our household and it's really helped us and I think it can help you as well. So that's what we're sort of using that um, to help guide our conversation through the scripture. And today you found us on week six. If you've missed any of the messages and that appeals to you at all, you can go back and pick it up on the podcast. Last week, Steve... uh, the pastor who was just up here before I got up here, he did an amazing job with type five, the investigator, those who want more and more information before they make decisions. Today, we're going to turn our attention to this type of person, the loyalist, the committed and security-oriented type. Now, I've said this every week, let me say it again. Each and every one of us have a piece of this in us. So, because while I don't identify primarily as a loyalist, certainly I like having security in my life. I mean, who doesn't want security in their life? But these people have this basic desire to have that security and and support. And so because of that, because they desire more predictability, more certainty... They, they tend to be reliable people. That would be consistent, at least. If you, if you like consistency, well, you should be consistent. And so they tend to be reliable, hardworking, responsible people who uh, know how things work, know how things should be, uh, want things to be predictable, care a lot about you and your comfort and those sorts of things. And so they tend to be great troubleshooters because they can see where something might not be stable or predictable. And they like to build cooperation. Interestingly to note that the majority are, no, let me scratch that. Most people, so it's not a majority because there's nine different types. Most people, I've still said it wrong again. Okay. I'm a professional talker. Can you not tell? Um, Anyway, type six is the most common type. That's what I'm trying to say. The most common type in the Enneagram. Okay, so most people in American culture who've taken this test, of all the different types, more, there'd be more sixes than any other. And so you can sort of see this in our world, okay? So the type six type person, right? They want, they, they, they can because they like security, because they like stability, 
they have a dark side. And, and I know I've spent a lot of time when we've gone through this series on the dark side, but that helps us kind of see where we've let sin impact our lives. And so let's go to the next slide because we'll see that these things are true, that they have a need to be sure or certain, which is a problem living in the world because often things aren't certain and often we can't be so sure about everything. And so they have a fear of being without support and being without guidance, living in an uncertain world, which makes them cautious and decisive and often suspicious of others. So if you ask a type six person where they want to go to lunch after service, well, they, you might get, well, I don't know, where do you want to go to lunch after the service? You might drive around for a half hour, right? And then try to go to Chick-fil-A. And that doesn't work well on Sundays, which this happened to my family a lot when my kids were little. The decisiveness, indecisiveness of uh, the loyalist type person. When a loyalist is receiving a text message, for instance, and the little three bubbles come up, you know, the three bubbles, you're anticipating, you're anticipating. And then the three bubbles disappear. <laughs> that drives the loyalists nuts because they're like, what were they going to say? Especially if it appears, disappears, appears, disappears. And then there's finally a reply and it's just like, K. <laughs> or, Yep. Like, what do you mean, yep? Do you mean, like, enthusiastic, yep? Or do you mean, like, aggressive, yep? Or I don't understand, right? So these things drive the loyalists crazy. They, they tend to have self-doubt. Did I say that the right way? Did I not say that the right way? What are they really thinking? These sorts of things. So perhaps you can relate. Perhaps you know someone well uh, that would fit this description, and certainly, living in this culture, where this being the most prominent type person, our news networks know this, okay? CNN and Fox News take full advantage of the loyalist, okay? It's always, it's fear, isn't it? There's lots of fear. It's Russia. It's climate change. It's walls. It's, I'll try to offend all of you, okay? It's what I'm trying to to do. But the bottom line is what? This world often tells us to be anxious, be afraid. You're not sure this could happen, that could happen. Which leads to this next statistic. And they say that 80% of statistics are made up. You guys are smart. Thank you for that. Thank you. But I read this the statistic, and it said that there are 40 plus million adults in the United States, age 18 and older, about 20% of the population of adults who suffer from an anxiety disorder. And I will tell you this from anecdotal evidence. Last spring, I did a sermon on James 5, where we talked about laying hands and praying over people. And so what we did during that sermon, at the end of the sermon, I said, hey, the scripture says we should anoint you with oil and pray for you if you're sick to be healed. And so if you have a physical illness or an emotional thing or a mental illness of any sort, why don't you come down forward and we'll pray for you. And you can ask any of the pastors who came up here and prayed along with me that time and time and time again, we had a similar prayer request. And the prayer request was for anxiety and depression. Anxiety and depression. I'm suffering from anxiety. And it dawned on us at that point, which is really a big part of why we've done this whole series, we need to speak grace and truth into our lives especially for those of you who can really relate to this. Because anxiety is the outcropping of the fear that often grips the person who has a need for things to be certain. Now, this is nothing new. The fact that we human beings are anxious. Why do I know that? Because we have the scripture. Uh, Jesus, in his famous Sermon on the Mount, talks about uh, this tendency for us as human beings to be anxious, to be afraid. 
And what Jesus is doing in this passage is actually he, he talked about giving and praying and fasting in Matthew chapter 6 right before we get to this part. Because what he's trying to get people to do is to get them to depend less upon the things in the world, the things that they can see, the things that they can touch, the things that they can, you know, taste, these sorts of things, and to show them that if they're so dependent upon these things that they will be anxious. He says you have to look towards something different if you want to solve the anxiety problems that you might be facing. So this is what Jesus does. He, does. he just comes right out and he gives us a command. He says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body not more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his or her lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? I like <laughs> the words of Jesus so much because they're so clear and to the point. He gives us a command and he gives anxious people a command. And so if you tend to struggle with anxiety, anxiousness, my tendency would be to really soft serve you some truth. And what I want to serve you is truth in a soft way, so to speak, in a grace-filled way. But Jesus gives you a command. And this is what Jesus says to you. Don't be anxious. So if you call yourself a Christian, if you say, Jesus is my king, he's the one I follow, he's the one I model my life after, the one I've given my life to, well, he's telling you, do not be anxious. And he's telling you that your anxiety comes from a lack of faith. He, he says, if you're anxious about all these things, then you need to consider what are you putting your faith in? He says, faith is the antidote to fear. You're fearing, you're anxious because your faith is in the wrong place, which again is why right, he taught about Praying, giving, and fasting right before he gets into this. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it, if you think about it logically. Because Jesus calls us to fast. Why? Because he's saying spiritual nourishment is more important to you for your life, for, for stability in your life. Spiritual nourishment is more important than food is. So he calls us as his followers to abstain from eating food at times. Why? So can, we can be reminded that that's not the primary way we get fed. We get fed through the word of God. He says, I want you to be generous and give. Why? Because what, what happens is if we're holding on to our resources without a willingness to be generous, without a willingness uh, to, to let go part of what God has given to us, then he says, well, then where's your faith really? It's in the things that you have. You possess your physical material possessions. So he calls us to give and he calls us to pray. Why? Because he says your wisdom and where you seek knowledge from should first be your father in heaven. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. So praying, giving, fasting are ways that we exercise our faith so that we might overcome our fear because if we're looking for our stability, for our security, for our certainty in this world, well, we're going to be anxious. So he says, verse 31, don't be anxious. Don't, don't say, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles, those who don't believe in me, he says, seek after all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. 
The command of Jesus, do not be anxious. The words of Jesus, you lack faith. You're putting your faith in the things of this world. Now, he says, graciously, he says to put your faith in the kingdom of God. See, let me ask you a question. What makes you anxious? I'll rephrase. From where do you gain your security? I, I mentioned up front that we all struggle with this because I've talked to you and I, I struggle with it myself, even though, again, I, I don't primary, re, primarily relate to this type. I'm certainly anxious about things. Right? If you consider the perfectionists, the type one, they're anxious about not being perfect enough. The helpers, the type two, they're anxious about not being needed enough. The achievers, they're anxious about not accomplishing enough. The individualists, they're anxious about not being unique or special enough. The investigators, they're anxious about not knowing enough. The enthusiasts, they're anxious about not being involved enough. The challengers are anxious about not being in control of enough. And the peacemakers, well, they're just anxious that we're all anxious, okay? <laughs> they're like, can you just settle down? Can we all just get along, you know? <laughs> when you consider the things that Jesus talked about, and then some things we'll get in here in just a moment, he says, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. He, he, he's talking about not just our physical clothing, and our physical substance, I think he's getting to this. I think a lot of us are anxious about our health, aren't we? And then he says, you know, he talks about money a lot. A lot of us are stressed, aren't we, about financial resources. A lot of us are anxious because of a relationship tension in our lives. Maybe it's a marriage, maybe it's another relationship. Maybe it's a relationship between our, our parents, what, whatever the case may be. I, I know that these cause me anxiety and stress. You know, I, I think about my health. I get anxious about that sometimes. Uh, my, my father died before he was 51 years old. Now, I'm not 50 yet, but I'm not that far from it. And I get anxious about that sometimes. I certainly get anxious about my kids and their well-being and their health. You know, you have these little kids and immediately all, everything, you know, you think about things that could go wrong and they begin to walk and they're like, oh, the world's dangerous and you're going to get hit by a car. And then you blink and they're driving cars, you know, and then you're just always a wreck. <laughs> because there, there's just uncertainty in, in life. You know, <clears throat> I mentioned that, that uh, this is the most prominent type of all the nine types. But what's really interesting is when this type of person is under stress, under stressful conditions, what they do is they transition to become a three, an achiever, not a healthy three. And it makes perfect sense if you think about it. That's why I like this instrument too, because I think it does provide lots of insight into the human condition. Because think about it, if I like certainty and if I like stability, and I'm not seeing it in my life or around my life, and I'm stressed out, you know what I'm going to try to do? I'm going to try to achieve more. Why? So I can create more stability. I'm going to try to do more. I'm going to earn more. I'm going to be in control of more. So if I go from wanting security and not finding it to now trying to create it, and I become stressed out. Remember I told you, if you typed the country, the United States of America, just in general, type the country. It would be a type three, an achiever. So to me, I was studying this passage and thinking about all this. I'm like, that makes perfect sense. We have, a, we have a society full of people who are looking for security and stability. And when they're not finding it, they race to try to achieve it themselves. And that's why you might say, you know, we're caught up in the rat race or, you know, we're constantly worrying about what if. I talked to someone who identifies with this so much and they, they told me, it's like I have a blender of anxiety, this, you know, throw in a little relational anxiety, a little monetary anxiety, a little anxiety about future success or whatever. And you blend that up and you have just this big ball of stress and uncertainty. And so what Jesus said to us is what? He says, Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first that. Why? Because that's the thing that you can look to and go, 
it will never be shaken. It will never be uncertain. And that's why I wanted us to go to Hebrews chapter 13, the the end part of, of 12 into 13, because it gives us some more handles to hold on to. Now, Hebrews, it's interesting when I said what? I said faith is the antidote to fear. Chapter 11 is all about faith. So if you read through Hebrews chapter 11, you'll see all these great stories of faith. People who saw uncertainty but didn't get frozen by their fear went to God to help overcome that fear through faith. Well, then at the end of chapter 12, the author of Hebrews starts talking about how shakable things will pass away. But he says, he says this in chapter 12 and verse 28, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. So the consuming nature of God, that that everything belongs to him, that he is an eternal flame, this God, we should offer our lives in worship to him. The scripture's uh, exceedingly consistent here. Offer our lives in worship to him, giving everything over to him. Why? Because he's unshakable. And he says we should be grateful that we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken, that is certain, God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And when that word begins to be spoken over your heart, and you don't just speak it in sort of a cliche, trite way, like, oh, I know that's true. No, you meditate on that word, and you allow that word to, to dictate your day, and not the anxiety and the fear of the world, well, then you're standing on stable ground, right? The, Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. It's anxious enough for itself. But we do know this. <coughs> Trouble will come our way. Uh, s- someone in our family is going to get sick. Uh, that's not a prophecy. It's not a prediction. It's just a reality, isn't it? We'll, we'll, have, we'll have financial instability in the future. That's going to happen. It always does. That's why Jesus says, build your house on the rock so that when the storm comes, it stands, right? So the unshakable kingdom of God. And then what I think the author of Hebrews does is gives us ways to live that out. Because I'm reading this and I'm like, oh, The author of Hebrews talks about relationship and money here and how we're supposed to deal with those things so that we stand on solid ground. Let me just work through these as quickly as I can. So let's look at Hebrews 13, 1 through 4. There's five different types of relationships, I think, that's listed. Four and kind of a a subset of one. He says this, Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware, which I love that. Uh, Verse three, remember those who are in prison as though you are in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. And let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. Now, listen, here's the context. The context is the unshakable kingdom. And so he says, now here's what you can do. Okay, for instance, you can uh, let brotherly love continue. In other words, you as believers should continue to love each other unconditionally with an agape type love. Let me ask you a question. If you have a friend, brother and sister in the Lord, and they, and they show you unconditional love, and they're there for you. Does that make your life more or less stable? More stable, doesn't it? Less shakable. When citizens of the unshakable kingdom don't practice unshakable things like gossip and deceit and envy... <laughs> When, no, 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 we don't do that. Why? Because what does gossip do? It causes uncertainty. It causes shakeability, doesn't it? What does envy do? It divides things. It makes things unstable. You get the point. The scripture makes sense. 
Let brotherly love continue. Why? Because you're a citizen of an unshakable kingdom. So be an unshakable citizen to your brothers and sisters, you see. That's why we shouldn't neglect to show hospitality to strangers. You ever been a stranger in a place? Maybe you've walked into this church as a stranger. How'd you feel? Super stable? No, you didn't. If you go to a party and like you walk in, you're like, you, you thought you were invited, but it kind of feels like you weren't. Once you walk in, you're like, and you look around like, I don't know anybody. This is awkward and everybody seems to have a good time. I wonder if anybody saw me. Can I just disappear? Right? And no one will know I was here. Maybe that's never happened to you. It's happened to me. When you're a stranger, you feel uncertain. You feel a little vulnerable. This is why Christians, it says, we are to show hospitality to the stranger. Why? Because we bring the stableness of being a citizen of the kingdom into their lives. Why? So it helps create a stability and less uncertainty. So I often think about this, and last week I didn't preach. So when I don't preach, it's dangerous because I just walk around and look at stuff, all right? And, uh, and we could be better at this. And, that, and that's not an indictment on anybody. If we're going to be a, a place that's welcoming and loving and encouraging to all people, all strangers, everybody who comes in here, it's on all of us. It's on all of us. See a person by themselves, go up and ask them, hey, are you new? Or hey, you know, do you need help? The bathroom's down here. The coffee's over here. Hey, the kids, the area's here. Just show hospitality to strangers. Oh, and by the way, you might be entertaining an angel when you do, and that would be kind of cool, you know? Whatever. I think it'd be cool. I, if, I, if I'm like chilling like, and showing love to an angel, I can't wait to get to heaven and hear about that one. All right, whatever. Um, what, what about this? Um, remember those who are in prison as they were in prison with him and those who are mistreated since you're also in the body. If you've ever been to a prison, been in prison, known someone in prison, think about it. Is that a stable situation for the family? loved ones in prison or is, is that a stable situation? I, I'd say probably not. Probably doesn't feel super stable. Probably doesn't feel super predictable. Probably doesn't feel super secure. And what this, this tells the, the alien, the foreigner, the stranger among us, that, that we as citizens of an unshakable kingdom bring to bear the unshakable nature of our king in the relationships that we have. What about marriage? Oh my goodness. I don't have a statistic for this, but I venture a guess that there's probably no more important relationship on planet Earth than marriages when it comes to creating stability in culture. I, I do know this, to create a stable, secure household, <laughs> my wife and I need to be getting along, need to be loving each other, need to be sacrificing for each other, need to be submitting to one another out of reverence to Christ because that creates stability in my home. You want to know how to be a better parent? Love your spouse better. And oh, by the way, it says we all have to honor marriage. All have to honor marriage. And, and it, it's, I, I just love the scripture because it goes to places we probably wouldn't go. He says, honor, honor the marriage bed because when you step out of the marriage covenant, sexually speaking, it brings massive instability and anxiousness, you see. Now, that doesn't mean that if, if this has happened to you and, 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 and perhaps you've stepped out of your marriage covenant and done so, it doesn't mean the grace of God isn't here for you. It is. But see, what the scripture constantly does is meet us right where we are. Jesus loves us right exactly where we are right now. Like if you're sitting in this chair, you're listening to these words, Jesus says, I love you. I love you right here, right now. You don't have to go out and clean yourself up and come back next week and then you'll be accepted by, by me. No, Jesus says, I love you right here and right now. And then what he says to you at the same breath is, and I love you way too much to allow you to stay there because I see more for you. I see, I see. Jesus sees us in all of this. He goes, I see where you're, you're anxious because you're, you're walking here on shaky ground because you're putting your faith in the things of the world and that stuff could go away tomorrow, but I'll be here tomorrow just like I am today, you see. Unshakableness. And that's why then he goes to uh, money next, verse five. He says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. 
Why? Because he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Anybody that's ever invested in a 401k knows that sometimes the 401k leaves you and forsakes you. Okay? That's like the disclaimer in every commercial. You know, past results are not a guarantee of future success. Why? It's, in, it's unstable. The 401k may not be there tomorrow. The housing market might crash again. Chances are good. We're living in Phoenix. It's going to happen. He says, be content with what you have. Because trust me, if you think just another 25 grand, another 50 grand, and another 75 grand will make you stable, you're sunk. It won't. It won't. It won't do it. Because if, if that's what you're worshiping, I'm not, I'm not saying it's wrong to get raises and make more money. It's not what I've said. What I've said is if that is your stability, X number of dollars in the bank account, X number for this or this salary, if that is your stability, if that is your kingdom, buckle up for a bumpy ride. We have an unshakable kingdom. So we put our resources, uh, or, or sorry, we put our, our faith and our trust and the limitless resources of God. So that's why uh, the writer of Hebrews concludes this way. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you, the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday. Here you go. And today and forever. So don't be led away by diverse and strange teachings for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. All this is saying is, hey, God's the same. He's unshakable. If you have somebody teaching something like, hey, Jesus is just gonna provide all for all your material needs and tomorrow, if you follow Jesus then your marriage is gonna be better and your finances are gonna be better, then that's, that's a garbage teaching, okay? So hold fast to the true teachings of the word of God, right? Jesus is our rock, not our genie. He's, he doesn't, he's not a lamp that we rub and come out and go, okay, I want this and that. No, that's, that's not Jesus, it's a false, that's why he says, I think that's why he says it. Don't be led away by diverse and strained teachings. For it's good the heart be strengthened by what? By grace, not by foods, not by external things. By grace, the grace of God. Right, God, Psalmist, Psalm 18 says he's our rock, he's our fortress, he's our deliverer. He's in whom we take refuge, he's our shield, he's our salvation, he's our stronghold. So these are the things that hopefully from this church, from this pulpit, from this stage, whatever, that we're, we're looking towards the things of God. We're not putting our trust and our hope in the things of this world because those bring anxiety and fear. And, and it says, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear because this world cannot do anything to me. And so we cast our anxieties on Jesus. Do you do that? Are you still holding those anxieties? What are you anxious about? Are you holding on to those anxieties? Because last time I checked, it says we're supposed to cast those burdens, cast those on Jesus. And you know what Jesus did? He took that to the cross, you see. Like that's why we're supposed to die to the things of the world. All the things that bring instability, we're supposed to die to those things. Why? Because Jesus hung him on a cross, <laughs> right? When you, when you, when you look at the, the scripture and you look at your life and there's a tension and there's a problem, Jesus is always, there's always a solution in the truth of who Jesus is and what he did. Like I was thinking about this, reflecting on this and I thought, gosh, was Jesus ever anxious? And as I often do, I go to the end of his life because you have this sort of climax of what's happening in the life of Christ. And it says in Matthew chapter 26, it says, taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, Jesus began to be sorrowful and troubled. If you, if you look at the, the translation of the word troubled, you'll see amongst the definitions, anxious. So Jesus begins to be sorrowful and troubled. He begins to perhaps if I can read between the lines, feel a little shaken. 
So what does he do? Then he said to his friends, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here with me and watch with me. But it's a good thing he didn't just have his friends. It's a good thing he did have his father because this is what he says. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed saying, my father, if it be possible, let this come pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus, when he began to feel troubled, he says, hey, I began, he began to feel troubled. He began to feel anxious. He says, okay, what I can't do is start looking at the world. And okay, so, you know, what we would do and what Peter tried to do is like, okay, we're, get, things are getting unstable here. All right, call in the cavalry, get my sword out, get some things going. And Jesus says, no, that's not what we're doing here. We're going to the kingdom of God, the unshakable kingdom, you see. If my, if my ground is feeling unstable, it might be because my faith is in the things of the world. Now there's grace. I, I just think about that. And some of us in this room are going through tremendous things, tremendous things. But Jesus would say, hey, I became your instability on that cross, right? Jesus became sin. The, he who knew no sin became sin. He says, I took on the instability of this world. I took it to the cross. So when you're feeling unstable, you're feeling anxious, you're feeling troubled, do what I did. <laughs> Turn to God. And remember what I did. What, I, what, what Jesus did for us is he took that all, that insecurity to the cross and, he, and it died there. Because on the third day he rose again, victorious over instability, victorious over death victorious over fear, the many things that we fear, didn't he? And so when we put our faith, hope, and trust in Jesus, we're putting our faith, hope, and trust in the unshakable kingdom. Where is your trust? Where is your faith? Where is your hope? Where are you finding your security? If it's in anything other than the cross of Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, you might want to give that some more thought and some more prayer because there's only one thing that's unshakable. There's only one thing that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can come to you in our uncertainty, in our, in our um, insecurity, and you're there for us. Father, I pray for those who are suffering from anxiety. Father, it is nothing to be taken lightly. And Father, I pray and hope that what people did not hear today was some sort of a condemnation or you know, if they were just somehow better, that they wouldn't suffer. But Father, I do hope you, you also can communicate these words to people and to their hearts. By the power of your spirit, Lord, I pray that people have heard that there is security and stability in only one thing, and that is you. So Father, as we talked about, I pray that we would be brothers and sisters who would be that encouragement to each other, who wouldn't backbite and talk and gossip, but who would continue in brotherly love, agape, unconditional love, carrying each other's burdens, being there for one another. Father, I pray for this, the stranger among us, that, that we might reach out to that person, that we might lend a hand to that person, that we might make their life a little more stable not because of us, but because of what you've done in us. Lord, I pray for marriages. I pray for God, our, our resources, that while resources and finances are important, Father, may we not worship them. May we not find our security in them. Father, may we be a people who are citizens of an unshakable kingdom. And may we live from that truth.